Okay, I'm delighted to welcome you to the next lecture in the Our Changing World series. Today's speaker is Dorothy Crawford. Dorothy qualified in medicine from St Thomas's Hospital in London and she was awarded a PhD from Bristol University for studies on Epstein-Barr virus. After holding a research fellowship at University College London, Dorothy was appointed senior lecturer and subsequently reader in virology at the Royal Postgraduate Medical School in London and then she was appointed Professor of Medical Microbiology medical microbiology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in 1990. Dorothy took the Robert Irvine Chair of Medical Microbiology at the University of Edinburgh in 1997 and headed up the School of Biomedical Sciences from 2004 to 2007 and she was then appointed Assistant Principal for the Public Understanding of Medicine. Now, Dorothy was the first to identify Epstein-Barr virus um, as the cause of a very nasty degenerative disease. And I think she may tell you more about this, but I'm not sure if she will. But I think what's more important, that this is a potentially fatal disease which is caused by this virus. And Dorothy then went on to find a treatment that would successfully cure this. So the basic research that she's done has led to really important cures for people. Now she published around 200 research papers, 200 original research papers, and she's been elected a fellow of both the Royal Society of Edinburgh and the Academy of Medical Sciences, and also a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians. And she's been awarded an OBE for her services to medicine and higher education in 2005. So I think that you'll agree that that's a very impressive academic record. But Dorothy's very actively engaged in promoting interactions between science and the public. And she's written a regular monthly science column for the Scotsman newspaper for 2008 to 2009, and has written two popular science books, which you can see up here. One called The Invisible Enemy, A Natural History of Viruses, and the other, Deadly Companions, How Microbes Shaped Our World or Shaped Our History. Another book is currently being written with co-author Tara Wormersley and that will be published in 2010. And it's, in fact, it will be published this month. Um, and it's called From Body Snatchers to Lifesavers and it's Three Centuries of Medicine in Edinburgh. So look out for that book in the next few weeks. Now... The Our Changing World lectures are for students and for the wider public to listen and find out about our researchers in a wide range of disciplines and to see how they're tackling big global problems. If you miss anything, you'll be able to check it online because all the lectures are being videoed and put on the university website. And I particularly want to thank Mayank Dusha and Gareth Leng who developed this course for the University of Edinburgh, because this is a real breakthrough and a really different kind of course at Edinburgh. And I'm especially pleased today to welcome a number of school people's pupils in the audience from Pathways to the Professions. Now, this is a long-standing programme at the University of Edinburgh where we work with young people from backgrounds who have little experience of what it's like to go into the professions and they, we let them find out much more about law, medicine, veterinary medicine and architecture and encourage those who've got a lot of talent to enter these professions. So I hope you're going to enjoy hearing these lectures from our really talented and inspiring academics. And I'm now going to hand over to Dorothy Crawford for tonight's lecture, which is called The Invisible Enemy, Microbes and Us. So, Dorothy. Well, thank you very much, Mary, for that rather flattering introduction. And thank you all for struggling out on a terrible night like this. And thank you to the, for the, org the organisers for inviting me to give this talk. I'm delighted to do so. Um, strangely enough, uh, as Mary says, the, these are the front covers of my two books. And uh, one of them is called The Invisible Enemy, which is the title of my talk tonight. But in fact, 
Um, I'm actually going to talk mostly about the subject of deadly companions uh, because that is how microbes shaped our history and that seems to fit rather well into this particular series of lectures. Um, so uh, most of the things I'm going to be talking about come actually from that book. So let's get started. Here's an outline of the talk. Um, I want to introduce microbes to you. I, I know many of you know uh, a lot about microbes, but I'm sure there are some people out there who don't. So I want to introduce them and, and how they survive, just briefly. Um, and then uh, look at how and why infectious diseases uh, have changed through, through the ages, along with um, our history. Uh, and then ask the question, how have microbes affected our history? and end up by looking at whether we are better or worse off uh, than our ancestors were. So um, to start, this is uh, a 12 hour clock um, representing life on Earth or, or the, li the life of our planet. Um, the planet formed uh, around about 4.6 billion years ago, which is up here. Um, and you can go all the way around the 12 hours and uh, get to modern day here. Um, the first life forms appeared about four billion years ago. Uh, this was once the Earth had cooled sufficiently for there to be water on the planet, uh, because all life forms, as far as we know, require water. And the first life forms uh, to appear were um, sort of primitive bacteria-like organisms, um, and they appeared, uh, as I say, around about four billion years ago, around about here. And one of the points I want to stress about this time clock is that bacteria and other microbes had the planet to themselves um, for the vast majority of the life of the planet. And so, of course, they have um, adapted to the planet an awful lot better than the rest of us have, as I think you'll see as we go through the talk. So it was only actually about 600 million years ago that multicellular organisms began to appear on the planet. And they had to wait um, until some bacteria um, had worked out a way of um, metabolizing, which produced oxygen as a waste product. And as oxygen uh, increased in the atmosphere, um, then multicellular organisms uh, could evolve because they could use that for respiration, uh, which is a much more efficient way of respiring uh, and required for multicellular organisms. So whereas bacteria can use all sorts of different uh, ways of generating energy, uh, they can use nitrogen, sulfur, and a variety of other things, all the rest of the organisms on the planet um, are uh, locked into the use of oxygen and carbon dioxide um, in that uh, photosynthetic cycle. So the first hominids uh, appeared around a million years ago, and modern man evolved in Africa, it is thought, somewhere around 200,000 years ago, which is actually one minute to midnight. Um, so we are incredibly new on this planet compared with um, other life forms, and I think that's really the point I want to get across from that uh, diagram. So how do microbes survive? Well, very basically, to survive, all living things must generate energy and they must reproduce. Um, and microbes, as I said, have evolved many different ways of, of uh, producing energy from various different sources. Uh, and just a few of these microbes um, have uh, evolved to use other living things as a source of energy, i.e. they've become parasites. And in doing so, some of them may cause disease. Um, so these are the ones which, obviously, um, as humans, we are most concerned with, the ones that infect us and cause disease. But you have to remember that that is a very, very small minority of all the microbes out there. I mean, there are literally millions of different sorts of microbes. And uh, one of our professors, Professor Mark Woolhouse, worked out quite recently and published the fact that actually it's just over a thousand of them uh, that cause diseases in humans. So most of them are not our enemies um, and are really, you know, quite friendly, I think. So in order to infect humans and be successful, microbes have to spread between us. Um, and they have evolved uh, many, many different ways of spreading between their hosts. In fact, I usually say to audiences that I would challenge anybody to come up with a way that microbes could spread between individuals that microbes haven't already thought of. Um, so in close contact, of course, not only a handshake, but uh, kissing and sexual contact, microbes spread very, very easily. Uh, they can hitch a ride with a vector like this mosquito here. Um, spreading through the air like this 
um, from a sneeze or a cough is the most efficient way of spreading between individuals in developed countries, uh, whereas in developing countries, uh, spreading in water is the most efficient way. But as I say, there are many, many other ways. I read recently in the medical journals that the um, rabies virus had spread from one individual to actually two other individuals in transplanted organs, uh, which is really astonishing. Obviously, the person who uh, died and provided the organs actually died of rabies without uh, the medics realising it. And the organs, the kidneys went to one person, the liver to another, and they both developed rabies. So um, that is a fairly amazing way for the rabies microbe to spread. OK, now for the point of this talk, there are really just two different sorts of microbes. And by microbes, I mean uh, bacteria, viruses, um, mi microscopic parasites and uh, things like that. I'm not being specific. Um, but there are two different sorts, really, two different categories, if you like. One is the acute infectious microbes. And these are the ones, like the flu virus here, which they infect a susceptible individual. They uh, reproduce very rapidly. Um, having to beat the immune response uh, developing in that person, which will kill them off. And so before that person develops their immune response, they have to have produced their offspring, and their offspring have to be on the way to somebody else. The flu virus, of course, spreads through coughing and sneezing through the air, but as I said, there are many other ways of spreading. So these microbes require a continuous chain of susceptible individuals um, to infect. They have to go from one individual to another without a, a break in the chain. If there's a break in the chain, they'll be dead. That'll be it. They'll, they'll, um, they won't survive. So they really have a pretty hectic li lifestyle, if you like. And these are the ones that cause epidemics and pandemics, mainly in children, because children are the ones who are not yet immune to these organisms. So those are the acute microbes. Um, then there are the persistent microbes that have developed uh, a rather more leisurely lifestyle, if you like. Um, these infect their host and colonise them um, for, the, for the lifetime of the host. Uh, and they have developed ways of evading the immune response and hiding inside the body for the lifetime of that individual. And uh, herpes viruses, like the one I've got here, are absolute masters at this particular um, way of living. But of course they do have to spread from one individual to another eventually because when their host dies they will die with him or her. Um, and so they do what we call reactivate over a lifetime and these, these uh, microbes then pass uh, generally from one generation to the next to the children that have been born in the community. So those are the two types that I'm going to be talking about during the talk. And what we're going to be looking at is the different ages of man, as I call them, um, ranging from the, the hunter-gatherers, uh, then to the farming era, uh, followed by the development of towns and cities. Uh, then we'll look at uh, traders, uh, travellers and colonisers, and finally end up with the modern era. And just look at the different kinds of microbes um, that each phase um, has been uh, upset by or bothered by or even killed by. So hunter-gatherers, if you'd been born anywhere uh, up until about 10,000 years ago, you would have been part of a nice, small, isolated band um, of people, 30 to 50 uh, people representing maybe a couple of extended families. Uh, you would have had no permanent dwelling. You would have spent your life uh, really travelling, uh, foraging for food. Um, and although you may have stopped uh, in certain places for a week or two, um, th there were certainly no, as I said, no permanent dwellings. And you would have had ex an, a life expectancy of somewhere between 25 and 30 years. Now, uh, so the question we need to ask is what problems from the microbial point of view did hunter-gatherers have? And this is actually quite a difficult question to answer because, of course, microbes leave no fossil records uh, unless, that is, they um, affect bones or teeth uh, when you might be able to find some fossil records, but in, on the whole, they don't. Uh, and so really, one has to gain um, information about these uh, from the few hunter-gatherer tribes that are still left around today in South America and Central Africa. But of course, these tribes people do have links with the outside world, but nobody can say that they um, are entirely isolated, so it is slightly different. Um, but uh, the conclusions that people have come to are that, 
um, hunt these hunter-gatherers had no acute infections, so they were not bothered by the typical acute infections um, like uh, flu, measles, mumps, rubella, all these things. Um, however, they did have persistent type of infections. And the reason that they had no acute infections is probably because, as I was saying, these acute infectious microbes have to keep moving from one individual to another. And okay, they may have infected uh, a small hunter-gatherer band. In fact, they do infect the hunter-gatherer bands um, of still present in the modern era. But when they get into such a band, everybody is susceptible, virtually everybody becomes infected, and then they either die or they develop immunity, and the microbe has nowhere else to go. So it, it dies out. And, and therefore, the acute infectious microbes just don't have a lifestyle that is suited to the hunter-gatherer. Um, however, uh, it's quite different with the persistent infections. Um, as I've already pointed out, uh, these include the herpes viruses, and I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Also, things like tuberculosis, and uh, very important, the vector-borne microbes, um, and particular, the particular one I'm going to show you is trypanosomiasis that causes sleeping sickness. So here's an example of a herpes virus. This is the chickenpox virus, um, which uh, I think we're all pretty familiar with. Um, this causes uh, a general, uh, an infection with spots like this, generally in children. It's generally not a severe infection, and uh, you've generally recovered in a couple of weeks. But um, although the rash may have gone away, the virus remains. Um, and the virus in the skin, in these spots here, um, infects the nerve cells in the skin and actually travels up the nerve fibres all the way to the central nervous system uh, where it establishes a lifelong infection uh, in the nerve cells. So I would imagine that virtually everybody in this room is carrying this virus, um, unbeknown to them maybe. But this virus does reactivate in later life and when it does it causes shingles. And uh, shingles is a similar rash to smallpox but this occurs just along the uh, length of one single nerve. And here it is along the line um, of the sciatic nerve, which is the longest nerve in the body. And the reason for that is because it's reactivated in the nerve cells of this particular nerve and nowhere else in the body. And so it travels back down the nerve, uh, oh, sorry, down the nerve fiber, uh, causing this rash. And of course, uh, the rash is lots of uh, tiny little blisters, each of which contains thousands of viruses, which then uh, can pass on to people who haven't been infected, which, as I say, is normally the next generation. Tuberculosis is another um, persistent type of infection, and nobody was quite sure um, when humans became infected with tuberculosis, um, but this... Uh, amazing picture here um, was published in the British Medical Journal in 2007 and I simply couldn't resist it because it's the, it's the skull bone, a skull bone, from a young male Homo erectus, which is one of our distant ancestors. And it was found in Western Turkey and reckoned to be about 500,000 years old. It also apparently, and I'm no expert here, uh, shows uh, lesions uh, suggestive of TB meningitis around the, this is the eye socket here, and around the edge here, this rough bit. And of course, if that's true, then clearly our hunter-gatherer ancestors were infected with tuberculosis. And another disease which can sit in the lungs, or another microbe that can sit in the lungs for the lifetime of an individual, often reactivates in later life. And classically, you get coughing grandparents passing this microbe on to their grandchildren. But most importantly, historians think, is uh, the sleeping sickness bug, the trypanosome. Um, here it is swimming in somebody's blood up here, um, and this is a tsetse fly that spreads it from one person to another. But actually, um, the trypanosome is not a natural infection of humans. It's a natural infection of the wild game on the African plains. And virtually every one of those animals is carrying this microbe in its blood, uh, but it causes absolutely no problem to these animals and it's spread between them by the tsetse fly. But if a human gets infected uh, by a microbe-laden tsetse fly, then it's 100% fatal without treatment. Um, and just to show you, this uh, is the geographical distribution 
of sleeping sickness, which entirely follows the geographical distribution of the tsetse fly. So it occurs in a belt across the centre of Africa. It moves slightly year to year, uh, and this is in modern times, um, but historians think that it was probably pretty similar um, in the hunter-gatherer era. And they also think um, that, uh, I've said modern man evolved uh, 200,000 years ago in Africa, and then there was an exodus from Africa 50,000 years ago, uh, which, oh God, sorry, which um, eventually colonised the whole world. And uh, it's really thought that hunter-gatherers could not survive long in the trypanosome belt in Africa, because if you think about it, the hunters in a, in a band would be um, the young males, and they would be the most likely to become infected because they would be coming into close contact with the wild game. And if a band of, of 30 to 50 people lost a few hunters, they really wouldn't be able to survive. Um, and so it's thought that man's exodus from Africa um, was certainly um, partly caused, at least, by the trypanosome. So with that rather rapid whiz through um, several thousand years, um, I'm going to move on to the farming era. Uh, and this began about 8,500 BC. It began in the Fertile Crescent, uh, which is this area here uh, that the Romans called Mesopotamia. Uh, it's between the rivers Tigris and Euphrates in modern-day Iraq and Iran. And there, they first domesticated wheat, goats and sheep. And this uh, domestication spread very rapidly east and west from that area. Um, and other centres also invented domestication um, in isolation, including China, um, in about 7,500 BC, uh, several centres in Africa, about 5,000 BC, Papua New Guinea, we now know, about 7,000 BC, and interestingly, in the Americas, um, it was much later, so somewhere around 3,500 to 2,500 BC, uh, and I'll come back to that when I'm, I'm talking about um, the Americas later. So this was a complete uh, revolution in uh, the way that uh, our ancestors lived. They were now living in permanent village settlements, um, and this led to much closer contact between individuals. Um, it also, they were storing their food and water. Instead of collecting it and it fresh and eating it um, or drinking it, they were storing it. Um, and also, instead of leaving their sewage and waste materials behind and moving on, uh, these were accumulating in, in their village setting. And they also shared their um, dwellings with domestic animals for the first time. Uh, and this picture I have here, some of you may recognise, is Scara Bray on Orkney, um, which uh, just shows you how tiny these dwellings were and how cramped and airless and dark. Um, they were absolute... I know people were smaller in those days, but that really doesn't account for it. They are tiny. So it was very much more crowded uh, living. Microbes, of course, had a field day. Uh, because they spread by close contact, or in fact all the ways that microbes spread virtually were enhanced by this kind of lifestyle. Uh, and also added to that, uh, the microbes from domestic animals were added to the pool. So they were now living in, in, often in the same dwelling as their domestic animals, who carried a load of microbes, um, which took the opportunity to jump uh, to humans for the first time. So really, the early farming era was a very unhealthy time uh, for our ancestors, and they developed all these amazing new diseases, which are now called crowd diseases, for the obvious reason that they spread best in crowds. And these were the emerging infections of the farming era. Most of them were zoonoses, that means that they jumped from uh, domestic animals to humans. Uh, and then, uh, of course, at first they jumped and spread between humans and then died out because the community was quite small. Um, but eventually they learned to uh, spread between humans much more effectively and they could spread wide, more widely. They obviously thrived in the filthy crowded farming villages. Uh, they caused recurring epidemics. Uh, and because they induced lifelong immunity, they required a minimum number of people in order to be able to be sustained within the human population. So initially, each epidemic was sparked by a jump from an animal to a human and then a spread and then it died out. But eventually, um, as towns and villages got bigger and bigger, 
and people travelled more widely, they, were eventually, they eventually became entirely human uh, microbes. And uh, this list here is uh, certainly not exhaustive. Literally hundreds of, of microbes jumped to humans at that time. And as I said, it must have been a very unhealthy uh, time for our ancestors. But you can see um, the common ones there. So just to look at a few, smallpox uh, was one of them. Here's the smallpox virus over here. Um, and uh, using molecular techniques, it, it used to be thought that it jumped from cows, cowpox jumped to humans. But using molecular techniques, uh, scientists have recently showed that that isn't actually the case, that the smallpox virus that we have or had, uh, which causes this, uh, caused this absolutely awful um, disease with this horrible rash, is actually most closely related uh, at the molecular level uh, to the camelpox virus and the gerbilpox virus. Um, so it's thought that uh, it's pro it was probably the gerbil pox virus that jumped to both humans and camels, and uh, they can work out that this happened about 5000 BC. So, you know, near, close to the beginning um, of the farming era. And uh, when, obviously, humans were domesticating camels, and when al also when gerbils would have been taking advantage of the filthy villages that people were now living in to scurry about and uh, spread its viruses about, presumably, as well. Um, we know that smallpox is uh, a pretty ancient disease. This is uh, the mummy of King Ramesses V of Egypt, who died suddenly um, in 1157 BC. He was only in his early 30s, and uh, his mummy suggests, certainly, that he died of smallpox. I don't know if you can see from where you are, but there are certainly pox-like lesions. Here's a big one here on his face and on his nose. Um, and those have been biopsied, and uh, they show virus particles which are suggestive of smallpox. Measles is another one, um, and this uh, is now uh, shown that its uh, RNA is most closely related to the rinderpest virus, um, which infects cattle, and uh, to a lesser extent to the canine distemper virus of dogs. Uh, and these molecular studies show, again, that it, it was probably um, that the rinderpest virus and the measles virus diverged somewhere around 2,000 years ago. Um, so again, you know, during the farming era. Now, despite what I've said, it wasn't all doom and gloom in the farming era because actually uh, it was a success. We're still doing it, some of us anyway, aren't we? Um, and the, the villages grew into towns and then into cities. And of course, they became more and more crowded and really more and more dirty. Um, and uh, microbes, some microbes anyway, certainly took advantage of this. Um, and it's been calculated from modern-day uh, populations, particularly island populations, um, that you require uh, for measles to be able to circulate continuously within a, a human population. You require about half a million people. Um, and the first cities of this size arose in Mesopotamia uh, around about 5,000 years ago. And this here is a picture of Jericho, which is thought to have been one of the very early um, cities that developed. Um, and so, round about that time, microbes were able to make the leap to humans and, and then um, circulate continuously and not have to keep uh, jumping from their animal source. And at that stage, of course, they could then start evolving with their new host um, and their new host could start evolving resistance to them. Uh, and, of course, at the same time that these towns and cities were developing, uh, people were also uh, travelling wider as traders, travellers, armies, and they carried these microbes with them uh, to other populations. And so they spread very widely throughout the old world. Oh, yes, the old world. And eventually, it's reckoned by about um, 1200 AD, there was a common infectious pool throughout the whole of the old world. And a sort of cyclical childhood epidemic pattern was established. Uh, you can see here, uh, this is the epidemic pattern of measles uh, before 1964 when the vaccine came in. It used to come round about every two years and cause an epidemic. And it was just dependent on there being a, a large enough population of naive individuals, usually young children born since the previous epidemic came around. And uh, as I say, uh, we could develop genetic resistance and uh, the microbes could also develop um, to become less severe. Um, and so the, the whole thing really sort of 
um, well, it became in a cycle, and uh, certainly they, most of them anyway, became less severe. Um, smallpox is one of the ones that doesn't seem to have become particularly less severe, um, and one of the ones that certainly thrived um, in the crowded cities um, of the Western world, um, right up until uh, the vaccine was developed in uh, the late 1700s, and eventually the virus was eliminated in 1980. But this one travels through the air, um, and it is actually the world's number one killer virus. It killed um, around about 300 million people in the 20th century alone, and before that, of course, nobody was counting. It's fatal in about 30% of cases. Uh, it, it causes blinding and scarring um, in some of the survivors, and it really was um, absolutely an absolutely terrible infection. Um, and so um, we can ask the question, did smallpox change the course of history? And uh, I would like to answer yes to that, um, because in the 17th century, it wiped out um, the UK House of Stuart. And if you look at this uh, family tree here for the House of Stuart, uh, the ones in blue died of smallpox. Um, so I don't know how good your history is, but Charles I had his head cut off. Um, so he was eventually uh, succeeded by Charles II. Uh, Charles II had already lost uh, his... L oh, no, that's not true. H um, his younger brother there to smallpox uh, and his elder sister. And he um, had no legitimate offspring. Um, and so he was succeeded by his brother James. Um, who was unpopular and eventually uh, disappeared and was succeeded by uh, Mary here, uh, the daughter of Princess Mary over there. And uh, she married William of Orange, but she died uh, very shortly at a young age without having any children. And so William of Orange continued to reign. And when he died, uh, he was succeeded by Anne here. And she had one son, uh, but he died of smallpox. Um, so, you know, I think we have to say that that changed the course of history. And uh, amazingly, uh, within 80 years of this uh, event, uh, smallpox also killed Louis I of Spain, uh, Louis XV of France, Ulrika Eleonora of Sweden, and uh, Peter II of Russia. So by picking off the royal families, and that was well, not obviously the only people it was, you know, the virus was picking off, um, it certainly changed the course of history. Now, the other um, lethal microbe that was around at the time was uh, Yersinia pestis, uh, which causes the plague. And uh, I'm sure that many of you are familiar with this, so I, I, I'm not going into detail of it, but I think I have got some interesting um, recent things to say about it. Um, so let's just say, uh, it's, it, this is, again is not a natural infection of humans. It naturally infects wild rodents, um, and it circulates um, in plague foci around the world, spread between the rodents by their fleas and uh, causing them no problem. Um, and if you look at the plague foci in modern days here, uh, you will see that we don't have one in Europe. Um, and so if the plague does come to Europe, it's got to come from somewhere outside of Europe. Um, but there's an astonishingly large plague focus in the United States, which is spreading rapidly from the west across to the east. Um, and that, uh, the plague arrived there um, from uh, an outbreak or a pandemic which started in um, Hong Kong and was taken by boat to California in uh, the early 1900s. Uh, it infected the rodents then in the United States and has been, as I say, spreading in the, the rodents in the United States ever since. So that's an interesting one. Um, so epidemics only start um, if... Uh, house rats or black rats get infected with this microbe, um, which they do by contact with these plague foci. Um, and black rats are very susceptible to this uh, microbe. They die very rapidly. Their fleas then jump off and find someone else to bite. And that, because they live in very close contact with humans, is often a human. Uh, and when that happens, um, then obviously they spread the microbe um, to humans. Um, the plague takes two forms. It might be a bubonic form, um, which is the most common kind, where you get these enormous swellings, or buboes, so-called, um, in the armpits, in the neck, and in the groin. Um, those are lymph glands which are swollen up. That's about 30% fatal. But sometimes it spreads to the lungs and then can be spread by coughing, in which case it's 100% fatal. So not a pleasant thing to have around, really. 
Um, and of course, I'm sure we all know about the Black Death, which um, occurred in the 14th century. Um, and after that, there were further outbreaks in Europe and uh, Asia and North, um, North Africa uh, for about 300 years. Uh, and this began in the Far East. Um, it was first noted in Kaffa, actually, which is a, was a Guyanese trading center on the Black Sea here. And uh, when they noticed it, the Guyanese um, immediately jumped into their galleys and sailed back to Italy, stopping off at Constantinople and Sicily on the way and spreading the microbe. Presumably they had rats in their boats which landed at these ports and spread it on the way. Um, it then spread throughout Europe, as I say, Asia and North America, killing uh, 30 to 50 percent of the population. Um, it followed trade routes, um, as uh, rats presumably do, and it spread actually really remarkably quickly. It spread from the bottom to the top of the United Kingdom in just three years. And then um, in, the in the 1720s, it disappeared from Europe. So um, the real question that I want to pose to you today was, was the Black Death caused by Yersinia pestis? Um, uh, obviously, we all assume it was, but when you think about it, um, actually, the microbe was not identified for about 600 years after the Black Death. It was identified um, during the outbreak in Hong Kong that I was referring to when the microbe was carried to the United States. Um, so it was certainly a retrospective diagnosis that was made here. Um, and there are historians around now who say that it definitely wasn't caused by it and it's all a big mistake and that it was caused by something completely different. Um, so if you just look at the evidence here, uh, the yes side seems to be based entirely on um, descriptions written at the time uh, of these large uh, swollen uh, lymph glands or buboes that I've been describing. They were certainly a prominent feature of the illness, but then, you know, they're not absolutely unique to, um, to the plague. They, do, they may occur in, in other infectious diseases as well. Um, on the no side, um, it's true that there are absolutely no mention of dead rats in first-hand reports. And you would have thought um, that if everybody who was infected had to be infected by a rat that had died, then there would certainly have been a lot of dead rats kicking about. I mean, maybe there were anyway in the Middle Ages. I don't know. Well, I imagine there were, but you would have thought that somebody would have mentioned that. There's also a lot of mention of person-to-person -person spread um, and of isolation of cases seeming to prevent the spread. Um, and there's a particularly interesting um, study done by these uh, historians in a village called Eme, um, somewhere near to Leeds. I don't know if anybody's been there, but the whole village is actually uh, a museum uh, to the plague because when it came there, the vicar um, persuaded the residents of the village to close the village down um, and for nobody to go out or nobody to come in uh, so that it wouldn't spread any further. And they simply lived there in total isolation with friendly villagers leaving uh, medicine and food sort of on boundary stones, as they called them, two miles out of the village, and they would go and collect them for six months. And uh, more than half the population of the village died during that time. Um, uh, but this did seem to prevent it from to spreading to other areas. So, um, you know, that wouldn't be the case if it was spread by rats because nobody was stopping rats going in and out of the village. So that, um, that study, which is, uh, was very carefully um, monitored by the um, vicar of the place, uh, that's, those records have been used to study it. And these historians feel that the incubation period was too long, the death rate was too high, the spread was too quick. Um, so that is fairly convincing, but I must admit what I've been more convinced by is the fact that black rats, as I've said, are house rats. They originally spread from the Himalayas. They like it quite nice, well, the foothills of the Himalayas. They like it warm, and that's why they live in, in human habitation. They lived in the thatch of, of houses, for example, in those days. Uh, they really can't survive in the cold, um, and they are rare in the north of Europe. And in, in fact, in Iceland, apparently there were none at the time, and yet, um, as I've said, the, the plague spread so very, very quickly, and it did spread to Iceland, um, even though there, apparently no, there were apparently no rats there, and it was too cold for their fleas anyway. So I think there's room for doubt, and what these scientists are doing now is um, digging up people buried in plague pits, and uh, all they can actually get is their teeth, and so they're looking at the tooth pulp to see if they can detect any um, DNA from... Uh, either the plague microbe or other microbes. 
And I can't tell you the answer because they don't have an answer yet, but um, it's a sort of watch this space type of story. But it's clearly not uh, that clear cut. OK, I better hasten on. Um, and so now, I've, uh, so far I've really only been talking about the old world, um, and so, um, but now microbes are globalised like everything else. And so if we just look at the new world, um, humans probably crossed uh, the Bering Straits here uh, from Siberia to Alaska when it was a land bridge. Um, and that was probably out about 14,000 years ago, and they then populated the whole of the Americas right down to the very bottom. Um, the land bridge then um, was submerged about 10,000 years ago at the end of the last ice age when the uh, sea level rose and the Americas became an island, a very large island, but an isolated island. And contact was only really re-established uh, between the old and the new world in 1492 when Columbus sailed the ocean blue, if my history tells me right. Um, so if we just look at the Americas, before the Europeans arrived, uh, it seems that they had no crowd diseases there. And this is despite the fact that both the Incas and the Aztecs had very thriving uh, populations of somewhere between 25 and 30 million each. Uh, they had um, cities like this one here, which is Machu Picchu, very crowded dwellings, cramped and all the rest of it. Um, so the probable reason that they had no crowd diseases is um, that they had very few domestic animals. As I said previously, they domesticated animals rather late. Um, and they only domesticated llamas, turkeys, guinea pigs and dogs. And this is probably because actually they'd killed off most of the ones and eaten them, most of the ones that might have been um, uh, domesticated, like uh, herd animals. Um, so uh, I suppose we have to assume that uh, these particular animals just didn't carry microbes that, that could jump to humans. So this was really a very unfortunate time for the Native Americans. They had a large population, they had crowded, dirty cities, they had no immunity, and they had no genetic resistance. And uh, these microbes were arriving by the boatload uh, as soon as uh, Europeans started going there. And so they got absolutely overwhelmed with, um, and again, this is the same list of microbes that I had before, but literally hundreds of microbes that they'd never met before. And so it was really um, like a, a replay of, the, um, of what happened in the old world, but as I think I say in my book, with the finger on the fast forward button, it happened all very, very quickly. Um, so here we have European explorers, travellers, traders, they carried the acute infections with them. 90% of, of the Native Americans actually died and the population dropped to about 3 million over a period of 50 years. Um, so whole tribes, whole cultures were completely lost. Um, and then of course because the Europeans were there to exploit the workforce, um, they were growing particularly sugar plantations and they required uh, slaves more or less. Uh, when the Native Americans died and they couldn't get enough, their solution was to implore African slaves. And of course the African slaves then brought with them malaria and yellow fever, among other things. And uh, again, of course, this um, enhanced the, the death rate. Um, so again, it was obviously a terrible time uh, for the Native Americans, but by about 1700, um, the Eurasian microbes were uh, dispersed in America and indeed in other isolated populations like Australia, for example, and some of the other island populations. The same thing happened. Now I'm often asked, um, after going on about uh, the east to west spread, whether any microbes actually came from west to east at that time. And so I've just got a couple of slides because uh, syphilis is probably the most likely to have come from the Americas to um, Europe because it appeared in 1494, uh, which was just about the time when Columbus's men were coming back, or did come back, um, from the Caribbean. It's interesting, it attacked um, Charles VIII of France. His army uh, were occupying Naples, and he was hoping, I think, to become king of Naples as well. Um, but they were absolutely devastated um, by this uh, new disease. Charles himself caught it and was badly affected. Um, and so he had to retreat. And it turned out that... Um, Columbus's men had actually um, disbanded, they weren't required anymore on the boats, and they joined the army, you know, um, as sort of mercenaries, and so obviously it, it spread in that way. It spread uh, throughout Europe, Asia, and North Africa in just, in just six years. Um, and unlike the, the disease of syphilis that we had today, it was an acute 
fatal disease. And uh, here we have the picture of uh, somebody with the rash of syphilis. Um, but it certainly killed people in those days, and obviously we've developed some resistance to it now. And I usually read this out from my book, uh, because I think it's um, fairly typical of what happens today, but uh, I've written it down for you. The Italians called it the French disease, the French, the disease of Naples, the Poles, the German disease, the Russians, the Polish disease. In the Middle East, it was named the European pustule, in India, the Franks, in China, the ulcer of Canton, and in Japan, Tang saw. So, as usual, it's a question of pointing the finger always uh, at somebody else. But um, we think it probably actually was the American disease. Okay, so um, I think I've probably told you enough about all of that, and I hope that you will agree with me from what I've said, that the factors involved in the evolution of acute infectious uh, disease epidemics are, were, exposure to animal microbes, most important, um, crowding, uh, allowing them to spread very easily uh, locally, and then travel, uh, allowing them to spread more widely. And of course, poverty always uh, enhances all these things um, because of poor living conditions. Um, so what we're going to do now, just for the last few minutes, is to look at modern times and see how those factors um, are uh, making out today. So first of all, crowding. Well, um, this is a picture of a shanty town in South America, uh, where people live in extremely crowded conditions uh, with no fresh water, no sewage disposal, and all the rest of it. Um, and there are now over 6 billion people in the world, reckoned to go up to about uh, 9 billion uh, by the end of this century. And for the first time, I think just last year, or maybe the year before, uh, over half of us are living in cities. Uh, Tokyo taking the prize at 34 million. Um, so we certainly aren't doing anything about our crowding, at least not uh, among poorer communities. Poverty? Well, 17 million people a year are still killed by microbes, and although we don't see many of them, 95% of these are in resource-poor countries. Uh, there are 1.5 billion people who have no access to clean water. Um, there are still um, 10,000 people a day dying of HIV. So uh, poverty is um, a very, very important factor today in who gets uh, microbe-type uh, diseases and who doesn't. Travel. Um, well, of course, we're doing a lot of that. And I thought it was interesting just to look at this collapse of travel time, as it's called. Um, if you look at the time it takes to get from the UK to Australia, in the 18th century, it took a year by sailing galley. And so if you were a microbe, uh, like supposing you were the measles microbe, you would actually have to get on board inside somebody and then you would have to spread to six people on board the, the sailing galley uh, in order to step off at the other end. Uh, but that's what they did, you know. But of course that got easier as time went on. 19th century, 100 days by clipper. Beginning of the 20th century, 50 days by steamer. And now there's absolutely no problem for microbes jetting around the world. You can get virtually from anywhere to anywhere virtually in 24 hours. So yes, modern times, over a billion people um, board international flights annually to and from 200 uh, countries or so. Um, and there are rapid movements, more rapid than ever before, of huge numbers of people. And here we have a picture of the Hajj uh, pilgrims, uh, where uh, literally thousands and thousands of people are all crowded together in probably uh, rather uh, primitive conditions. So, not surprisingly, uh, despite our modern knowledge, antimicrobials, health services and all the rest, uh, we do have an increasing number of emerging microbes. They're emerging at about the uh, rate of one a year. Most of them still jump from animals to humans. Uh, and then, of course, they're rapidly spread by travellers. And they're often highly lethal because we don't have any inbuilt resistance to them. And the SARS virus here is obviously a good example. Um, it jumped from... Um, the Himalayan civet cat to humans uh, in a live uh, market, a live animal market in China. It spread very rapidly locally through the air. Uh, and then one person who picked it up, a doctor in fact, travelled from um, Guangdong province to Hong Kong while he was incubating it. He apparently sneezed in the lift of the hotel he was staying in and that infected people um, in the lift, 11 of them, I think, who were then the next day boarding international flights and flying off. And so 
you know, you, you get a pandemic. And I think it's hats off to the uh, medical profession for actually containing that pandemic. Um, if there hadn't been, uh, you know, if, if they hadn't been very rapidly on the job, uh, I think it, it, it would have spread uh, very, very much more widely. So I just want to end up now with showing you a couple of other emerging infections which you may not um, have heard about. And the first one is Nipah virus. Um, this one emerged in uh, Malaysia in 1999. Um, uh, farmers, pig farmers, first noticed that their pigs were coming down with respiratory diseases. Um, and then uh, the farmers started coming down with encephalitis, uh, which was fatal in 50% of cases. And eventually, um, abattoir workers also developed this uh, uh, encephalitis, and eventually a virus was isolated, and it was called Nipah virus after the um, village from which uh, the, the person who it was isolated from came from. Um, and working backwards, it turned out um, that the Malaysians had been clearing an area of rainforest in order to build an airport, and that in that area of rainforest there were fruit bats, like this little one here, um, nesting in the trees, or roosting I should say, in the trees. And so they had to move off and find somewhere else to roost and they found trees very close to the pig farms. Uh, their droppings rained down onto the pigs, containing viruses which caused no problem to the fruit bats uh, but which infected the pigs and the pigs passed on to their owners, farmers. So um, that is just the kind of story that's um, typical of today's emerging infections. Uh, here's another one, monkeypox. Uh, this is a virus which is uh, wrongly named because it doesn't actually have anything to do with monkeys, uh, but it's naturally carried by rodents in Africa. Um, and this suddenly emerged in the United States in 2003 and caused, I think, 77 cases uh, before it was eventually stopped. Um, it causes a smallpox-like illness, but fortunately not as severe as smallpox, and none of these cases actually died. Now this turned out to have been imported to the United States um, in a giant Gambian rat, which looks like that. And this was imported for the exotic pet market. I mean, can you imagine? Has anybody here got a giant Gambian rat as a pet? No. Well, don't, is my advice. Anyway, um, they, uh, they carry the monkeypox virus. It causes no problem to them. But in the pet shop where they were housed, the, the virus jumped to prairie dogs. The prairie dogs were then bought by families and um, the prairie dogs became ill and then the virus jumped to the humans and they became ill. So again, you know, really, um, we don't have to do that, I don't think. Um, finally, bird flu. Um, you know, we have just had a pandemic of flu. It turned out to be extremely mild, um, at, you know, compared with what it could have been. But that doesn't mean that bird flu has gone away. Uh, bird flu um, first appeared in Hong Kong in 19... 97 and it's still around. Um, it's uh, been isolated several times from the United Kingdom and uh, I would have thought, uh, as most virologists would have thought, that it's certainly still poised to cause a human pandemic. So finally, are we better off than our ancestors were? Well, uh, we can take a vote on this if you like, but in my opinion uh, there are things on both sides. Obviously we have more scientific knowledge, uh, we certainly have more resources, we have antimicrobials, we have money, we have technology, and we have manpower. Uh, we have rapid response, uh, and we, can, we controlled SARS, as I pointed out, which really was um, uh, very well done, I think. But, you know, we have to be ready. Uh, we have to be waiting. Uh, on the no side, there is always this problem of resources not being equally distributed, um, that poverty is still rife, that there's a lack of global cooperation, um, we have antibiotic resistance looming. Uh, we also have global warming, which we're not quite sure what that will do to the microbes. Um, and as I've said, H1, H5N1 flu uh, could well be our next pandemic. So global problems need global solutions is my final word on the subject. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Dorothy, for a really stimulating talk. So I'm going to open it up to questions now. Um, if you do have a question to ask, we will come round with the microphone so that we make sure everybody else can hear the question. So can I ask you, if you want to ask a question, to stand up and ask your question through the microphone. So questions? 
sit quietly. Yes, okay, Gareth. Uh, <coughs> I was intrigued at the speed of spread of syphilis. I mean, I thought this was a sexually transmitted disease. Was it? Yes. Uh, but th yeah. That was the root of, of rapid transmission? Yes, yes. Oh. I think um, the microbe was uh, lucky in that um, these uh, Columbus's men immediately joined the army, which you know, um, has a lot of camp followers and what have you, and I think it, it spread uh, widely throughout the army. And then when um, King Charles retreated, all these people went back to where they'd come from, which, you know, were various countries in Europe, basically, and started uh, little epidemics, which turned into big et epidemics in all those countries. So that's how it happened, I think, yeah. Okay, other questions? Yes. Thanks. Staying on the speed um, of spreads, can you say something about the uh, studies that have been done on the possible speed with which H5N1 might spread if it does break out in southern China or somewhere of that sort? Uh, well, I think. Um, you know, in this day and age, it, it's going to spread before we know about it. I mean, it, it, for example, like the um, swine flu that started in Mexico, you know, I mean, f with flu, you've got, what, two or three days of incubation period when you're feeling quite well, but you're carrying it. And as I said, you know, people are boarding aeroplanes all the time. I think um, the thought of trying to contain that is, you know, I think it would just be a waste of time, really. It would be, I'm, I'm sure people would try co to contain it, and the only reason to try and contain it is um, in, in order to bide time while you're making a vaccine, really, which is what happened with swine flu. And eventually, I think you just have to assume that it's, it's out there and spreading. I mean, it, it's very, very difficult to control a thing like that. Um, on the note of swine flu, uh, would you say, due to the, the amount of hype that came out about the, um, the pandemic uh, recently, uh, do you think a lot of the public have become a little bit more, and maybe even the government, have kind of a, will become a bit more complacent? Um, and if there will be another a larger, more dangerous pathogenic mm. um, strain emerge, that actually the public health departments will have to work harder mm. in order to... Um, Sorry, in order to actually get the same response coming from the government and the vaccine being produced as quickly. Yeah, and no, I think that's a real problem, actually, because um, the, the way that that pandemic was dealt with was really extremely good. You know, that, that the government um, bought in the antivirals, that they set about starting to make a vaccine, and, th and the whole plan was to control it with the antivirals until the vaccine was ready. And it all worked fine. I mean, the fact that it turned out to be a mild form of flu is good news, you know, but, but unfortunately, it, as you say, it does make people complacent and um, people are now not going along for their flu jab and stuff for that reason. And, uh, you know, certainly um, if bird flu were to come and, and uh, you know, I don't want to worry people, it's got several mutations to go through before it's going to be able to infect humans, but I don't doubt that at some stage it will infect humans. And uh, it looks as if at least it, it would be a lot more dangerous. Um, and so it's unfortunate that the success of, of, you know, in a way of controlling that pandemic uh, will lead to complacency, but that's something that has to be dealt with, I guess. Yeah, you're quite right. Mm. Can you speculate maybe how quickly vaccines could be developed for emerging viruses now? Well, it's a long process, as you know, and, and most of the hurdles are, um, you know, to do with safety and uh, uh, efficacy and stuff. It's, it's difficult. Um, it, the flu vaccine is made every year, in fact, and uh, astonishingly, it's still a very sort of steam age process. It's grown in eggs, um, the virus, and it takes six months. And, you know, if we're going to continue to make it that way, I don't think that, that you can shorten that process, really. Um, and so, yeah, that's how it is. And I think, you know, it's like that with most uh, new infections. There, there is now um, a vaccine for SARS. So, you know, if it should emerge again, um, I think we could control it better, but um, that, that's how it is. Yes, a six-month wait, I'm afraid. Mm. Okay, any more questions? Gareth? 
just very curious as to why measles is a big killer, killer isn't mm. it? Uh, and I'm, I'm really curious as, as to why it is such a, a, a lethal disease in some parts of the world, and yet in our part of the world, even before vaccines, it was relatively mild. Can you? Um, I would never call measles a mild disease, actually. Um, what kills you from measles is not the measles, but the pneumonia that ca can come on top of it. And uh, if, you, uh, if a population is suffering from malnutrition or malaria, for example, or other um, diseases, then uh, the children are far more likely to develop the pneumonia. Um, so that's the problem, really. Yes, I mean, you know, it's been known to have a death rate of something like 30 percent and 10% uh, is more or less average. Um, and it's unfortunate, I mean, we're really more or less on the brink of, of eliminating that virus completely. Um, but in certain countries, it stays around because it's so very difficult to get the vaccine to certain populations, you know, where uh, war-torn countries and, you know, civil strife and all the rest of it, it's, it's just been very difficult. Um, so there are a few hotspots around the world. Um, but, you know, I, I would be optimistic that within uh, the next decade or so, certainly that virus will be gone. Yes. I'm just wondering, can you describe the worst case scenario in terms of an epidemic? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, do you mean, uh, are we ever going to get totally wiped out by an epidemic? That's um, often a question I no, get. No, not on. like um, coming back into, like, let's just say the perfect storm. <coughs> Sorry, the perfect storm thing. So let's just say in the perfect storm, like where all the factors come together and there is a really bad like pandemic or something. And you Yeah, know, well, like, I mean, you know, it it's perfectly possible that um, a pandemic of, uh, I suppose, I mean, even bird flu virus, if that were to um, tomorrow, for example, be able to infect humans efficiently and spread very efficiently between them, which is what it can't do at the moment. None of us have immunity to that virus. It at the moment kills about 50, more than 50% of those it infects. So, you know, that would be pretty horrific, I think. Um, but I'm not uh, a supporter of the, um, of the thought that, you know, some killer microbe could actually wipe out the whole human race, because I think um, we're so genetically diverse that, you know, I think there'll always be um, some people who um, have a sort of inbuilt resistance to, or, or you know, react uh, less severely to whatever microbe it happens to be. I mean, for example, the AIDS virus, there is like um, between 1% and 10% of the population who even have resistance to that virus um, because of some genetic uh, mutation that they have and the virus can't infect their cells. So I think, you know, there, there are always going to be um, a sort of, uh, curve with, with the worst cases dying but other people surviving, even in, in the very worst. I mean, even the plague, okay, it kills 30% of the population, but it leaves the rest alive. So, um, yeah, it, it could be pretty devastating, as the plague was, you know. Uh, the people that were left alive didn't just get on with it. I mean, they were completely disorientated and, you know, uh, most uh, bizarre situation, I imagine. And of course, um, I didn't go into the details, but when smallpox hit the Aztecs and the Incas, uh, and they had no inbuilt resistance or anything, more than half of them died. And, you know, their leaders died, their, the people uh, that they thought were gods died, um, and they, they were just totally disorientated. Uh, and so along come uh, the Europeans and, and conquer them with ease because, you know, they, they're just totally floored by it all. And, and you can imagine, particularly in, in an era when, you know, they didn't know what it was. They thought it was some sort of ghastly thing that God had sent on them or something, you know. So it's, um, yeah, it can be pretty devastating. <laughs> Don't lose any sleep over it. <laughs> Hi. Um, do you think zoonotic diseases provide the biggest challenges in the world? Um, I wouldn't go quite that far, <laughs> but um, I think um, for microbiologists um, uh, who are interested in emerging infections, uh, they are certainly the biggest challenge um, because that is where new viruses come from. You know, new viruses don't just suddenly appear on the planet for no apparent reason. They are out there in the animal population and they get the opportunity to infect humans. That's how it happens. Um, and so, yes, I mean, there, there are um, people, for example, um, 
who are working in the rainforest in Cameroon, where HIV came, came from, um, saying, you know, that we shouldn't wait to find out what's next to come. We should go and have a look and see what these animals are carrying. And they are actually identifying um, retroviruses which haven't been identified before and showing uh, that they have actually infected the hunters in the area. So, you know, there's, a, there's constant um, jumping of microbes. It just depends whether they take off and cause a, an epidemic or a pandemic or not. Um, so they're definitely out there, you know, and if we had all the money in the world or if governments were prepared to fund us, then that would, that's what we should be doing, you know, looking for them and, and finding them and stopping them before it ever happens. Yeah. Oh, microphone. microphone. Thank you. Um, I'm curious, at the beginning you mentioned um, a disease caused by Epstein-Barr virus that you had discovered and that you'd also discovered the treatment, and I just wondered if you could say what the two things were. Oh, well, that's the whole subject of another talk. <laughs> um, but Epstein-Barr virus is a strange sort of virus. It, it infects, it's a herpes virus, so again it infects almost everybody in this room will be carrying it, and mostly causes no problem at all. But occasionally it causes glandular fever, or infectious mononucleosis, when it first infects you. And uh, the, the um, disease that I was looking at um, is a, a tumour that occurs um, in people whose immunity is suppressed. So we're all carrying the virus, and because our immunity is healthy, we keep it under control. But if, for example, you've had a, a transplant and your immunity has to be suppressed to prevent you rejecting the transplanted organ, um, then there's a chance, and you know, I'm not saying it's a huge chance, but um, of developing a tumour related to Epstein-Barr virus. And so um, what Mary was referring to was that I, um, we're all controlling the virus with our killer T cells, which is part of our immunity. So what we did was we took killer T cells directed against Epstein-Barr virus from healthy blood donors, and then we infused them into the people who had got problems with the tumour because they hadn't got these killer T cells. And it worked very nicely, which is obviously very gratifying. Yeah, so in a nutshell, uh, the, the organisers will have to invite me back next year to give that talk. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Okay, well, I think that's a nice note to end on anyway, is to link back um, what you're doing now, to link everything back again to your basic research. And um, we're absolutely delighted that you're now very much involved with public engagement with science and describing all these things um, for everybody. So thanks very much, Dorothy. Thank you. This production is copyright, the University of Edinburgh.